practice makes permanent. Habits define what we, what we ultimately wind up doing because the habits we fall into, whether they're good and bad, are the unconscious expressions of, of our activity. So if you want unconscious competence that you were talking about, <laughs> Ben, yeah. you've got to create a habit of consciously being competent until it becomes natural. And I think so much about habit and productivity and just kind of eliminating distractions, single tracking, not multitasking, mm. so that the things that I do, I can do well the first time. And if I continue habitually doing things well, then how can I help but do them well, even if I'm not paying full attention to them? Welcome to Rochester Business Connections, powered by Balbert Marketing, LLC, where I get the chance to chat with Rochester, New York's very best business owners, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. I am your host, Ben Albert. Don't forget to subscribe. And remember, we don't do advertisements. My fee for this show is simple. If you gain value from the episode, personally share with a friend and explain your favorite part. Let's get started. Welcome everyone to Rochester Business Connections. I am here with Mike Bergen. Mike, what's going on? Ben, great to see you this morning. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. And I think this conversation is going to be just super value, go incredibly well because you're president of Chariot Learning. You teach SAT, ACT prep. Um, one thing we don't have to dive too far into, but you're also a bird blogger, which is an awesome side <laughs> side project. And you host your own podcast on you know, SAT and ACT prep. Am I correct? Well, what's the name of that podcast? So the, the podcast is Test and the Rest. And honestly, the scope of the podcast is a little different from Chariot Learning. You know, so Chariot Learning, we definitely focus, as we say, on helping students succeed in test school and life. So it's a big focus on um, standardized test prep, academic tutoring, academic coaching, Everything that students need to excel, usually in the high school range, we do work with some college students and we do GRE prep, but there's a lot of SAT, ACT prep. There's a lot of subject tutoring and the works. The podcast touches a bit on that, but it's really more open to all of the issues having to do with the college admissions industry. And that means testing, essays, Test, you know, recommendations and testimonials. Um, we talk about the plight of colleges and higher edu- the future of higher education. We talk about learning. We really are speaking on the podcast to parents and professionals in the industry. So I love to have, um, you know, I, I had just last week we spoke to the former president of Nazareth, uh, and you know we were talking about the future of education and innovation in higher education. Um, But then, you know, we'll turn around and talk about, uh, you know, what the future of the tests are or how to write a great essay. So it's really a lot, a lot of stuff going on basically. And a lot of what I do with the podcast and with my business and uh, as the founding president of the National Test Prep Association uh, or as a certified educator for ACT, where I train teachers across the country on the test. If people are talking about testing, I want to be part of the conversation. I love it. I love it. And you've gained national recognition and have talked to people all across the country, right? It's true. Uh, you know, certainly the last year required or, or let's say opened up the opportunities, but for a long time, you know, I, I like to say I'm nationally known in this industry, but very focused on our local activity. But yeah, I've been, you know, I've spoken about the test across the country uh, to, you know, thousands of professionals. I, we work with students across the country right here from our office in Rochester. It's, it's interesting, you know, the world is smaller now. We're all talking to each other online, remotely, and 
my industry, let's say test prep, is a really interesting industry because it's not built up the way most industries are. And it's very easy to contact a professional, somebody who does what I do in another market, and just have a really genial conversation. So we've developed some online communities, and that's definitely helped me learn from professionals across the country and opened up opportunities to share what I know. It's incredible. And I, I love what you're doing. Um, just as a side note, I'm reading a book right now. It's called Limitless by Jim Quick. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, what Jim, I haven't read that, but that's a, how are you liking it, Ben? Um, I'm just, so the testimonial section was like 20 pages in itself, and it's all testimonials from Will Smith and um, massive CEOs and, you know, people that I don't want to misquote who's in there, but people that everyone knows, people that everyone has heard about, um, attributing Jim Quick for his training. And yeah. for anyone who doesn't know Jim Quick, he does brain coaching, which looks at memory, retention, speed reading. He was the kid with the broken brain, right? He was born, um, you know, he had a head injury. He, he was never, you know, quick witted when he was younger and he learned how to learn properly. Now, I, I want to take his, he has a kid, he has a kid, he has a class for kids. He has a yeah. class for children because he wants to teach people at a very young age how to learn properly so they can succeed at whatever they choose in life. And I'm simple minded. I'm thinking I might even just take the children's course because it's probably all the basics that I wish I learned. I'm going to take a look at that class too. You know, I love that you brought in that concept of coaching your brain and understanding that because we touch on that a lot at Chariot Learning. We touched a lot on that on the podcast as well. We had a great interview with the founder of MindPrint, which works a lot on learning assessments on the science of memory. And it's fascinating how when you delve into that, you can pull out some really actionable skills, observations, and habits. So one of the things that we find is, so it's interesting because I talk so much about test prep. And when I talk about test prep, it's different than school, right? Okay, take it, preparing for a test like the SAT is so different from preparing for a test like the midterm in school. There are some fundamentals about study, but really preparing for the SAT or ACT is much more like a sport or a skill, right? And the fundamentals are practice and coaching. And so a lot of your success depends not just on, say, what you've studied, but what habits you've internalized and your performance when it counts. And when we talk about this limitless, this, this being able to bring everything you're capable of, your mental processing and your attention, your focus, when it counts, being able to retrieve the information. You studied information at some point in the past, but how can you grasp it and use it when you need it. And these are, these are fundamental concepts. And I appreciate that you're as fascinated as I am in learning more about it because preparing students for excellence in anything. And really, let's not just say students, let's say people, because you do so much with music, Ben. And you know that so much of being a successful musician is practice when nobody's listening, so that when you are performing, you can hopefully find that flow state where it all flows really naturally and, and, and the countless hours of work that you put in just come effortlessly from you for a really phenomenal performance. Testing is so much like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the grand moment where everything that you've done, the, the thousand hours you might have put into to prepare for that test, it all happens there. And yeah. Yeah, I love the alignment. You know, I bring up Jim Quick for a lot of the reasons you just said. I love when people are teaching the youth best ways to dive into a crazy world and be successful and be leaders because they're our future, right? Yes. And I'm wondering because I personally don't have kids. My girlfriend does. But a lot of people... I'd love that that teenagers listen to this. I don't know if any teenagers listen, but I do know a lot of entrepreneurs, business owners, successful salespeople listen to the podcast. 
and they have kids. Some yeah. are three, some are five, some are 15. Um, obviously, checking out Chariot Learning, listening to your podcast is a great start. Um, but if if we could give them some tips today of where they should begin, you know, taking a more active role in their child's life, in their friend, their nephew's life, and help them knock it out of the park when they do have a test coming up. So, you know, the best time to prepare your kids for success is very far in advance, right? Like the sooner, <laughs> the sooner you can start building great habits, the better. You know, there's that saying, practice makes perfect. But it's not, it's not true that practice makes perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect, but practice makes permanent, meaning that the things that you start doing early, if you just keep doing them, that's you. That's what you do until you change that. So whenever I talk to families and they want to know, well, how can my son or daughter get great grades? How can my son or daughter ace the tests? What can I do now to help her? in five years really excel? And there's one answer. I mean, there's a bunch of answers, but many of them boil down to one fundamental thing that I don't think is gonna surprise you, kids don't do today. Read, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Reading is fundamental. Remember the old Riff commercials? You might not remember, I think you're too young to not remember sure. the old commercials on TV. Riff, reading is fundamental. And the truth is, is that today's kids, teens, the, the, all of these generations, they consume a lot of content, more content than ever, right? But they're not reading. They're not using their eyes to interpret words on a page that then go into their brain where they have to process and comprehend. They're not developing the skill of reading, not the phonics piece, but the reading a piece of fiction or preferably nonfiction and understanding exactly without assumptions or projection what the author wrote that to say, right? You read an article and you want to walk away from that article knowing what the topic was and what the author wrote it to say about the topic. And that's all that you need to get out of it. That kind of reading is so valuable. And while kids to different extents get a certain amount of that in school, there's so much to be said for cultivating any kind of reading habit outside of school, any kind of reading habit. You don't have to judge what your child is reading. Just help them feel comfortable. And I don't mean like tweets, sure. okay? <laughs> I mean, I mean reading form. something a little more long form than that. But, you know, articles in magazines like, you know, Sports Illustrated or ESPN, absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as you're not just looking at the pictures and reading the graphs, but reading the articles and understanding what they're written for, you're improving your skills. So that's really a big piece. And, you know, another thing that's always valuable is to teach kids that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to fail as long as they can learn from their failure. That, you know, I'm sure that you've heard about the fixed versus growth mindset. Yeah. And the fixed mindset where somebody is a, more afraid to make a mistake than they are to not do the task leads to stagnation. It leads to intellectual uh, stagnation. It leads to poor performance in the long run, where we want students to cultivate the same attitude that musicians and athletes have to cultivate, which is that it's okay to swing and miss as long as you then take the opportunity to figure out what was wrong with your swing and do it a little better next time and practice the right way to go. You know, question, because I have the worst handwriting you'll ever see. I love taking notes because physically writing it out helps me, you know, remember it better. There's research supporting that, Ben. But when I'm multitasking and writing notes, I'll go back to my notes. I can't even read what I just That's wrote, right. Mike. I can't even read what I wrote. And <laughs> I genuinely think that there might be a fixed mindset issue where I never was a good writer. Mm -hmm. So I never became a better writer. Right. Do you think that, you know, when it comes to fixed or growth mindsets, is it nature? Like, is there things that you're just not as good at or is it more nurture that well, than we think? Well, there are definitely like, can things I that we don't all have natural aptitude for. 
Right. You know, it. growing up, very often people gravitate towards the things that they're good at. Sure. But there are also those examples of people that gravitated towards things that they weren't necessarily good at, but they were motivated to do. And then they really overcame that natural, uh, I won't say deficiency, but just lack of strength. Mm-hmm. You know, your handwriting, you've identified an issue, right? There's a very simple fix for it. But the fix sucks. The fix is practice. <laughs> the fix is, is writing over and over again and maybe even getting a writing coach. Somebody did help you unlock what it is that you're doing with your hand that causing that mm-hmm. and to write until you're satisfied with the result. Because if you can do it consciously, if you can force yourself mm-hmm. consciously to write in a way that is legible and maybe pleasing to you, the more you do that, eventually it becomes unconscious. And now that's the way you write. And I say this as somebody who's allowed his handwriting to (laughs) to generate to the point where even doctors make fun of me. (laughs) But I don't value it enough to try to fix it. Uh, But if I was going to, that's exactly what I would do is I would just force myself to consciously do it right until I can't help but do it right unconsciously, right? That's that's the other thing about practice. Mm. You don't practice till you get it right. You don't practice a song until, yeah, you finally get it right the first time. You practice a song or anything until you can't get it wrong, until it's just naturally the way you do it. Right. Well, what I've learned is there's incompetent, then there's consciously incompetent, then there's consciously competent. That's when you're competent, but you you have to think. That's where I am a lot of the time, like I'm always caught in my head. Then the goal, right, is to become Con- just competent where unconsciously competent unconsciously competent you can't help but be competent <laughs> isn't that a great place to be <laughs> yeah yeah and, and i do have one more question to to move back a little bit because you talked about the value of reading and i got to be honest with everyone I, i'm not on a high horse most of the time the horse is running me over or something because i just started actually reading mm-hmm. a couple years ago for the first time in my life, I actually read, and I just started a few years ago. What it inspired you to do that, Ben? That's a big shift from not reading to reading. Honestly, I think that, and again, this is going to be a, a fixed mindset statement, but I never really liked learning. I was kind right. of immature when I was younger, so it wasn't until later in life that I found value in knowledge and growth. I found that way later than I wished that I could have, but obviously the the best time to start is now always. But yeah. my question on what you're saying with reading, um, do audiobooks replace reading a book? What are your thoughts on consuming audiobooks versus audiobooks reading? replace reading a book if you are in the in, if you're focused more on the content? Meaning, if you just want to know what Dan Quick has to say then Jim you Quick. can listen to his book rather than read it. But no, for, for children and teens, they're on an arc, especially the college-bound ones, where they're going to have to be able to learn through text. And as long as that is the case, then they need to practice the skill of learning through text and not read it. See, there's a difference between reading and understanding. And a lot of times we accept the former. The teacher says, read this book. And the student says, well, I read the book. I didn't understand it, but I did look at every page. And that's not, when the teacher says, read the book, I mean, read it and understand it. No matter how many times you have to read it over and over, no matter what you have to do, understand the point. Because that skill, and you're fine, if you didn't read a lot, and then you started reading high-level material, you might have found yourself in a position where over and over again, you had to stop and restart and read the same sentence over and over again, and maybe even look stuff up. And you might have felt uncomfortable about how slowly you were progressing. And this is what happens when students don't practice the actual skill of reading. So yeah, audiobooks are, you know, my brother was reading The Stand. My brother's a prolific reader. Uh, he's an editor, actually. So, I mean, he, he's, he's a writer. He's, he's really 
immersed in the written word, but he was reading the stand and he was slogging through it, the 800 page book by Stephen King. And finally he admitted, I went to the audio book. I had to do it. <laughs> and that's fine. He's got nothing to prove. He's a master of the written word. And all he wants to do is consume the story. You take the story in whatever way works best for you. It's like asking, is a podcast better than an article? It depends on what you're looking for. I think podcasts are fantastic. I like articles too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and everyone should listen to your podcast. What What's the name of it again? Let's it's shout it Tests out. and the Rest. And Test you can it. go to testsandtherest.com. Um, it, it's, you know, this podcast is not for everyone because we really are catering to people who are interested in the college admissions process and everything connected to that. We do go get into graduate school and we get into, un, you know, getting into high school and issues related to K-12 education. But honestly, for those who don't have kids, they're already through college, they don't work in the sphere. It's not for them, but anybody that they know who's in that process, even if they're dipping into it just for a couple of years, we like to think that the the way it's structured and what we're delivering is so focused. Every episode has an expert guest and focuses on one particular topic. We've published, I mean, we're close to 160 right now. And we just keep going because we're having such fascinating conversations with people. Hey, congratulations on that. And I'm going to be listening to that more. It might not be for me at this stage in life, but I'm all about education and I'm all about supporting what you're doing here. And I guarantee I'll learn a ton from it. I appreciate that. You know, I'll send you the link to the science of memory. You'll love it. Cool. Science of memory. The science of memory. This is a, it's a dive into the research with an expert leading the way. I love it. And and we're going to do a few of these podcasts long term, Mike, because you're a published author. You're a nationally renowned bird blogger. We're going to touch a little bit of that, but I'm we're not even done yet. But I, I want to just call it out right now. We're going to need to do a few of these because of <laughs> all the things you work on. Right. But um, I, I never go a podcast without talking about Rochester, New York. Oh, now, good. You, I love to talk about Rochester. You're not you're not from here. You found your way here. Um, tell us a little bit about the history of what brought you to Rochester and why why you stayed with us crazy people. So like so many Rochester residents, I'm a downstate expat. All right. Born and raised in the Bronx. I had the full New York City experience growing up. Um, I left New York several times I tried to get away from the cold weather and I moved to Texas and I moved to California, but I always found myself back in New York because I am, I'm, I'm a New Yorker. Uh, so back in 2008, my wife and I we were living in a Bronx apartment. We had two kids, four and two. We were feeling very cramped in our apartment. I was working in New Jersey for Huntington Learning Center. So I was commuting. Anybody that knows the layout of the city knows to get from the Bronx to the to New Jersey. You've got to go over the George Washington Bridge both ways. I mean, it's just and I was really dealing with all of the hassles of New York City life. The cramped space, the traffic, the tolls, the hustle, all of that. So, you know, I thought, well. It's time to look outside New York City again. Got to go somewhere. Now, given my druthers, I would have moved anywhere in the world. I would have moved to Scandinavia if I could have, you know, just to try it because I love to travel. But because we had kids, I wanted to keep them in what I call the grandparent access. And while all my people were downstate, my wife had a lot of family upstate in rural Pennsylvania, just a couple of hours here from Rochester, uh, right here in Rochester. So we're like, let's check it out. My wife, who is not from New York City, did not believe for a moment that I would leave or that I'd come to Rochester because I was raised, and I'm embarrassed to say it, <laughs> with a little bit of a bias against upstate New York. <laughs> and so, you know, while I always appreciated the beauty, I didn't know about the culture. And so we came up and we had a fantastic realtor from North Nagel, not North Nagel anymore. I think they're Howard Hanna now. Um, you know, she showed us a bunch of houses all in one day. 
Uh, we came up for the weekend. She said, you either want to be in Brighton or Pittsford, but knowing you, you want to be more on the urban side of suburban. Brighton's perfect. And we're like, all right, show her, show us. We'd been up a couple of times and we thought Brighton sounded good. And we saw eight houses in one morning. Before dinner, we put an offer on a house. By the time dinner was over, it was accepted. It was the first house I ever owned. I, would all, I was always an apartment dweller. So I was a little freaked out about it, like living in a house with all these doors and, and, and a yard and all that stuff. Windows. Anyway, all the windows. I mean, look, in, in New York, you picture the classic New York City apartment. The one window to the fire escape has a gate on it. And the door <laughs> has locks and chains. And here I am, upstate New York, where people don't even lock their doors. And I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know about this place. But, you know, we moved here. And the house was just as great as we thought it was. At, you know, at first glance, it just turned out to be that great. The school district, I didn't know, even though I'd been in education, I didn't know that I was in one of the best school districts in all of New York State. Um, you know, any, any negative thing I had ever thought about Rochester and upstate New York in general turned out to be myth, propaganda. But all the positive things were absolutely true. And I couldn't believe that I didn't go back to New York City. That was the, the whole, like, everywhere I had moved, I always left and went back to the Bronx. After being here for a little bit, I was like, I'm never going back to the Bronx. And I mean, I go back to visit, but that's it. And then I get there, my, you know, by the time I'm, you know, an hour and a half outside the city limits, my blood pressure starts to go up. <laughs> I start to get ready for the fight. And then I come back to Rochester and I relax. I love it. And, and Brighton, as anyone in Rochester knows, you're right next to the city. I know. I know. Per, when I was a kid, I was the Brighton Penfield border. Yeah. Um, so I was Penfield schools, but I would literally bike to Record Archive when I was yeah. younger. The city was just a couple miles away. What a great place to have a home, raise a family, educate in Brighton, Pittsburgh, grease the entire surrounding Rochester area. It's incredible. So Yeah, and I work with students in all the different districts. And my, you know, when I moved here, my mother, who is like your classic New York City hick, meaning she thinks everything outside the city is farmland. Um, she, <laughs> she must she imagined I lived in a really rural area. And then she came to visit for the first time. And we walked up to Bagel Land and Starbucks. Yeah. And she's like, oh, I didn't, I had no idea. <laughs> I, I wish I could live here. So yeah, it, and this is a great place. And what's wonderful about Rochester, coming from a high pressure environment like I do, and from very high pressure school districts, is that we have all of the excellence and all of the opportunity and resources for our kids without the pressure. Kids here really can be who they want to be. Smart kids can be smart. Artistic kids can be artistic. Um, Hands-on kids can learn a trade. Like there are so many paths without judgment. Kids can just be who they are. And that, that's a wonderful place to grow up. It's a wonderful place to raise a family. I love it. Amen to that. Amen to that. And I want to touch on it. 10,000 birds. That's a yeah. lot of birds. That's a lot of birds. You know, when I started 10,000 Birds, so 10,000 Birds is a birding blog. That's what you're referencing, Ben. And when I started 10,000 Birds, there were fewer than 10,000 recognized bird species. But lo and behold, 16 or something years later, there are more than 10,000 birds. But that was wow. basically the premise. It was like, I want to see all 10,000 birds. Um, trust me, I'm not even close no matter how many countries I go to, like the, the list just goes up slowly. Uh, but 10,000 Birds is a birding blog. It's the world's oldest and most popular birding blog. And we have writers from all over the country writing about every aspect of enjoying birding, nature, conservation, ecotourism, the works. I love it. I love it. And it's 16 years running, you said. 16 years running. And, you know, we've we've been really privileged to grow it from just me learning how to blog in the early days when everybody was just starting this process and just learning to bird at the same time. I was always a nature person, but once I started being curious about all those birds that I was seeing that I didn't know the names of, 
I used my experience as an educator to blend two interests so I could teach myself while I was writing. Mm. And it just grew into something really beautiful. And I have a publishing partner. We have lots of writers. We've had many of the most well-known and beloved personalities in international birding as contributors to our site. The blog has taken me all around the world and I've been able to meet amazing people in so many different countries and been able to promote ecotourism, which is something I'm very passionate about. It's just wonderful. And, you know, I mean, Rochester has a great birding scene. It's, uh, you know, there are two different birding organizations here. There are people out every day chronicling what they see. We're lucky to have the lake, which is really such a great asset here. Uh, it's almost like an ocean, but, you know, no, you don't have to deal with salt water. And we have, you know, we just have a lot of great natural history things going on in Rochester and the Finger Lakes region. I love it. I love it. So imagine this, and it's true on my part and most people listening. I love birds. I love to look at them. I might have a bird feeder, but I can't identify them. And I've never really, you know, dive deep into that. If I were to go to 10,000 birds, any great places for me to start where I can get a beginner level education? And as a second to that question, if I'm more of an advanced person in the birding community, is there any articles or topics on on the blog that I would love so, as well? Well, the thing is, I mean, there are 7,000 articles on 10,000 <laughs> birds. <laughs> and and it runs the range. It runs the gamut where, you know, if you look up backyard birding on 10,000 birds, you might get, uh, you know, U.S. backyard birding, but it might be someone in Arizona seeing totally different mm. things. Or it might be a, a British backyard bird feeder or a Chinese backyard. Like, we just have so much. If you have a feeder and you see different birds and, you know, get past the cardinals and the chickadees, which you know, and you start seeing things you don't know. You're like, wow, what is that? Yeah. The best place to start is a really good field guide. And to have a field guide and to use it, when you see a bird, you, you know, get the Sibley guide to birds. That's really like the Sibley guide is great. You can get just the small one for Eastern United States, or you can get the full book and use it and research and connect with your local birding club in, in Rochester, it's the Rochester Birding Association. And the best way to learn about birds is to see birds with people that know them. Mm. And to when you see a bird, look it up immediately while it's in your, eye, in your eye or if you take a picture of it and digital photography has been such a boon to this process, read the guide and then you start to learn the guide. You start to understand distribution. You're like, I'm looking at a bird, but it, this says it shouldn't be here this time of year. Well, then it's probably not that bird. Or I'm looking at a bird and the guide says that it shouldn't be in New York State. Well, you're probably not looking at it. But every once in a while, there's that rarity that shows up. And rarities show up in the weirdest places. And some, if you really know what you're looking at, and the guide, you know, even if the guide tells you it shouldn't be there, it shouldn't be there that time of year, with enough knowledge, you can uncover something very surprising. We had um, this last year with with everybody locked down and unable to travel the local birders have done a lot more work like you know visiting local spots over and over again and we've had so many crazy rarities this year we had a bird called the nanhinga and, mm. and this was in churchville just a month ago and anybody who's ever been to florida or the tropics knows what an anhinga looks like it's like a cormorant but it has a really long snake it's like called the snake bird uh, I mean, a long neck, crazy looking bird, doesn't belong in Rochester along a frozen creek. Didn't work out for the bird. But I mean, the <laughs> fact is, is that we have, we, we just have the, the wildest, uh, the wildest rarities turning up and that you can't recognize it until you put the work in. I love it. But I it's also it. great just to get out. I was out the other day and I was, up at LaSalle Landing Park, which is right on Empire Boulevard um, by Lucian Morin. And 
I was looking at a group of gulls on the water and they all took off. And I was like, oh, there must be a raptor here. So lo and behold, there was an eagle, but an adult bald eagle just flew over and it targeted a gull and it was trying to hunt the gull. And this was an immature ring-billed gull and the eagle was trying to get it and it was, you know, the gull was more nimble. And then another bald eagle came and helped the, so two bald eagles pack hunting a gull right here. Things like this happen every day. You just don't see it unless you're out looking. Yeah, you have to have the lens where you're looking for it and suddenly you, you notice things you never imagined you noticed. That's right. Well, cool. Um, I'm going to grab my notepad here. Um, anybody who's listening or watching, grab your phone, grab your laptop, grab your notepad, because obviously we're going to have to follow up a little bit here because there's a tremendous amount of knowledge and information and um, just great stuff we could learn from you. So we talked about 10,000 birds. We talked about chariot learning. You also have a book that we don't have time to dive deep into. So I say we might as well just go read it. Um, how do I keep in touch? What are the websites, Facebook, Instagram? What's the best way to, so to reach out to you? So you can find Chariot Learning at chariotlearning.com. And that's chariot, C-H-A-R-I-O-T, L-E-A-R-N-I-N-G.com. You can find um, 10,000 birds at 10000birds.com. Try to keep these things easy. Yeah. Um, you can find Tess and the rest at Tests, T E S T S, and the rest.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Love to connect with people with, on LinkedIn. Um, the book that I co authored with a number of other Rochester business people is Crash and Learn. And it, it, that book. You may have heard of it because over the last year we promoted it. Um, we, you know, we published it last year and it's an Amazon bestseller and it's just a great collection of origin stories, business people who failed and learned from their failure to grow to success. So I had my own failure that I learned from. And, um, you know, when I tell my story of success, I can't tell it without crediting Rochester as the kind of place where you really can build a fantastic business in so many different industries. There's a lot to be said for our network and the openness of communication among people here, the, just the brain power, the education, the training. Uh, this is a great place. I know, I know people sometimes think that small cities like Rochester are not where the action is. But there's a lot of action here, and our prospects are fantastic. I couldn't agree more. Uh, right on the ball. Um, Mike, it's been fun chatting with you. As you probably notice, and anybody who listens notice, I like open-ended questions. I like to see where it's going to go. So I want to impart one last open-ended question, as open-ended as it gets. There's a lot of to uh, topics that you're a great educator on. In terms of education, a tip, a trick, or just uh, something to give us solace today, give us, you know, one free piece of advice to close out here, something that can, you know, push me in the right direction going forward. All right. Well, if we want this to be open to everyone, sure, you know, something that anybody can learn from, I want to go back to a point that I'm really thinking a lot about in the new year. And it's this concept that practice makes permanent. Habits define what we, what we ultimately wind up doing because the habits we fall into, whether they're good and bad, are the unconscious expressions of, of our activity. So if you want unconscious competence that you were talking about, Ben, <laughs> yeah. you've got to create a habit of consciously being competent until it becomes natural. And... I think so much about habit and productivity and just kind of eliminating distractions, single tracking, not multitasking, mm. so that the things that I do, I can do well the first time. And if I continue habitually doing things well, then how can I help but do them well, even if I'm not paying full attention to them? 
Mm. So that's, uh, I'm, I'm sharing that advice because it's something I think a lot about these days. And it can help anyone. Well, cool. Um, we'll need to do a part two because I just realized I forgot the rapid fire. Yeah, we fire didn't do around. the quick hits. We didn't do the rapid fire. So we're we'll have gonna, to do a part two. <laughs> we'll, we're going to have to tune in for the second one for the rapid fire. Hey, listen, I was engaged. I forgot you. It was even a part of the show, but I want to end it on a high note. Awesome advice from you. Um, everybody follow up with Mike and everything you're doing. And thanks again for coming on the show, man. It was awesome speaking with you. Thanks for having me, Ben. Thanks for listening to Rochester Business Connections. Don't forget to share this, rate, and comment on your favorite platform. You can also email me, ben at balbertmarketing.com. Let's connect soon. Until then, keep thriving, everyone.